In this video we're going to take a closer look into the world of bonds and fixed income investments. As before, let's bring back our favorite example of the cookie business. We will use this to explore how bonds come into play when a company needs funding but wants to avoid certain risks and maintain ownership. Imagine our cookie business is looking to expand and needs to borrow $10 million for a new fleet of manufacturing facilities around the world. Approaching banks for this loan represents a high counterparty risk that they're not willing to take. Thus, we're very unlikely to find one bank or a group of banks that are willing to have $10 million of exposure towards us and our cookie business. Moreover, we want to avoid diluting our ownership by issuing more shares. Note that in the real world, the sums of money for such cases are typically much higher, but the ideas stay the same. So, how can we solve this problem? One possible solution would be to borrow from a large pool of people by issuing bonds. A bond is a contract that states that someone gives us money now and we promise to pay them back in the future a bit more. Similar to stocks, bonds are usually split up into many smaller packages so more people can lend us a bit of money and we can therefore borrow a large amount. Creating bonds is called issuing them. This allows us to trade current money for a promise of future cash essentially taking a loan from the open market. To make things a bit more concrete, let's outline some of the most important traits of a bond. First of all, the company issuing the bond collects money from the bond buyers at first. Each holder of a bond is promised to receive back a value at the end of the life of the bond, which is called the face value. Oftentimes this is $1000. The end of the life cycle of a bond is called maturity. To motivate people to buy your bond, the bond issuer gives out small interest payments called coupon payments during the life of the bond. The size of these can vary depending on the bond and who issued it. Note that this feature of fixed payments is also why bonds and bond-like products fall into the category of fixed income products. Note that similar to stocks, bonds can further be traded on a secondary market after they have been first issued. Depending on a wide range of factors, the market price at which a bond is trading at on the secondary market can vary from the face value or what they originally were issued at. Let's see how we can use a bond for our cookie business to finance further operations. Let's say our cookie company decides to issue 10,000 bonds, each with a face value of $1,000. Furthermore, we're going to use a 5-year duration. By multiplying the face value with the number of bonds issued, we see that we're creating bonds worth $10 million, which is exactly the amount we need. This face value is what we promise to pay back at the end of the bond's term. In addition to that, we commit to an annual coupon payment of $50 per bond. These payments are a form of fixed interest paid out yearly based on the face value. To summarize, we get $10 million from many other participants now, then we use that money to scale our business and pay back the same $10 million after 5 years at the maturity date. To compensate lenders, we pay an interest of 5% every year until maturity. So overall, we therefore would pay back more money than we borrowed. Since we just discussed the risk-free rate in a previous video, we think it might be a good idea to offer our bonds at this risk-free rate, which we define to be 5% here. However, since our company could face bankruptcy and we may not be able to pay back our debt in full, our bonds actually carry way more risk compared to the risk-free asset. That means offering them at the risk-free rate will likely not be sufficient since investors would likely not loan us any money at that rate. So to compensate investors for this additional risk, we actually have to offer a premium over the risk-free rate, resulting in a total interest payment of for example 8%. This makes our bonds more attractive to investors despite the additional risk. In addition to offering a higher interest rate than the risk-free rate, oftentimes bonds are also sold at a small discount to the face value to further incentivize investors to lend their money. Here it is important to note that actually not all bonds operate on coupon payments. Take zero coupon bonds for example. These are issued at a discount and mature at their face value without any intermediate coupon payments. So let's consider a new concrete example separate from the previous ones. For this example we issue a zero coupon bond for $800 that matures in one year at $1000. The yield of a bond is the annualized return for that bond. 
That is the amount an investor will earn for holding the bond for one year. In the case of this zero coupon bond, there are no coupon payments. However, it is being offered at a discount, which allows investors to receive 200 additional dollars for loaning us $800 for one year. This leads to a very high yield of over 20% for the bond investor. So once issued, the bonds can be traded on the secondary market. This trading doesn't directly affect our company, as we're obligated to make the fixed coupon payments in case of normal bonds and repay the face value at maturity. However, the bond's price on the market can fluctuate based on interest rates and perceptions of our company's risk. To highlight this, imagine our zero coupon bond price is $900. Now suddenly, there's an unexpected announcement from the Federal Reserve stating that interest rates are reduced from 5% to 3%. That means the risk-free rate is now lower than before, which means people can earn less money without risking anything compared to before. Take a few moments and think about how this will impact the price of our bond and what will happen to its yield. Considering that the interest rate dropped, that means the risk-free asset now becomes much less attractive in comparison to our bond. Simultaneously, our bond with its current yield becomes much more attractive. Thus, investors will flock to buy our bond, pushing up its price and thereby reducing the implied yield. Let's consider another example. Imagine now that our bond's price is $950, but suddenly news breaks out that our company is facing liquidity issues. How do you think this would impact our bond's price and the resulting yield? This news would likely cause the bond's price to drop, increasing its yield. This intuitively makes sense as the perceived risk of bankruptcy has risen and investors will demand a higher yield for taking on this increased risk. It is easy to imagine that lots of investors would like to quickly sell this bond. However, it is less clear why anyone would buy it. This asymmetry is solved by lowering the price since other more risk-seeking investors might be okay with buying the bond if they get a significant enough discount and a higher implied yield. Note that this is not some manual mechanism of intervention, but instead happens automatically through supply and demand. In the event of bankruptcy, bondholders often receive preferred treatment over shareholders. This hierarchy underscores the relative safety of bonds compared to stocks. Besides corporate bonds, there are also government and municipal bonds, each with their own risks profile and investment characteristics. Finally, let's very briefly touch on the yield curve. The yield curve plots the relationship between bond maturity, that is the time until the bond investor receives back their money, and the bond's yield. We won't dive into the details here, however it's worth noting that the yield curve can shift, sometimes indicating economic trends such as an upcoming recession when it inverts. Note that the typical shape of a yield curve is that of a logarithmic curve, however this can change and does change over time as well. There are various theories exploring the rationale behind this, but that is outside of the scope of this video. So to summarize, bonds offer a way for companies like our cookie business to finance operations without giving up any ownership. They can be traded on the secondary market, providing liquidity and different risk exposures, including interest rate and credit risk to interested investors. There are various different types of bonds, varying in differences in their payout structures such as coupon and zero coupon bonds, and differences in their issuers such as government, municipal and corporate bonds. Further, bonds have an inherent inverse relationship between their price and yield, which is important to be aware of. Further, there oftentimes is a loose inverse relation between the fixed income market and the equity market, since in times of strong equity performance, investors typically prefer investing in equities over bonds and vice versa. However, this is much more of a heuristic than a hard fact that always is true.